What is up guys? Welcome back to another episode of Ryan Myers Expeditions. Today I'm coming to you from the big island of Hawaii here in beautiful Kona and we got something a little bit different for you today. Basically I've got a lot of clips spearfishing that didn't quite make it into any of our other kind of spearfishing vlogs. So all these clips came from different days throughout the last six months here spearfishing on the big island. As always I'm going to kind of break down what worked, what didn't, how I landed that fish or how I lost that fish. We've also got a knife jaw that I caught the other day and we're going to do a knife jaw catch and cook on what's quickly become another one of our favorite recipes. Again, follows one of those famous restaurants. This is gonna be the Nobu Miso Glazed Knife Jaw. We'll see you guys in the water. So one of my goals for this video is to really show you guys some of these skills that I'm out there using all the time and give you those tips and tricks to kind of do it a little bit better. Now, a lot of people hunt these omilus. I shoot them all the time too, but you can see how effective a well-timed grunt is. You know, a lot of times if you go down there and there's not a whole lot around and you throw some grunts out, those omilus or giant trevallis or kahalas or any of the jack species will come out of nowhere and come right over and check you out. One of the skills I wanna really emphasize today, and I hope you take away from this video, is to slow down so incredibly much. Now, however fast you're moving, you could always be slower. I want you guys to watch my gun in this clip, watch my kind of how I'm moving, and how slow and calm and relaxed everything is as I let this Moana Kali just kind of do its thing and I wait until he presents exactly the shot that I'm looking for. Again, here on this next clip, I'm going down, I'm hitting the bottom, and then I'm really just kind of posting up. I'm gonna try and keep my head turning to a minimal and try to keep any of these movements that I have to do towards the beginning part of my dive as they're kind of masked by me settling down and, and descending and, and hitting the bottom. So I wanna get it all kind of sorted to be looking where I wanna be looking, the gun where I want it to be, and be kind of as relaxed and as calm as possible to sit down there and wait for my prey to come to me. That's exactly what happens right here. This Moana Kali comes over. If you listen quietly there, you can hear a little bit of scratching. And again, I end up with a perfect stone shot that I'm looking for. So most of the time, these big goats are kind of out just cruising around. And if you spend enough time out in the boulders, in their zone where they kind of live, being relaxed on the bottom, waiting for them, a lot of times they'll just kind of appear out of nowhere. So right here, I'm doing exactly that. I'm turning the head as slowly as I can. I'm trying to see if anything is gonna come from a different direction, but I don't wanna spook it. So it's so important that I turn my head slowly, calmly, relaxed, and that way if something does approach, it's not gonna see me first and spook and leave. I see this uhu here and I swing the gun slowly into position and I kinda keep looking around to see maybe that uhu will come over, maybe something else will appear, and that's exactly what happened was his big Moana Kali came out of nowhere. You can see he's feeding right there, totally relaxed. He's just cruising around doing his thing and bumped into me. I got a great headshot here, but he kind of got snagged under this coral head. And this is something that I'll do out here a lot, is I'll actually go after him, grab him, make sure I got him secured out of the rocks before I go up. So a lot of times I get to the bottom and there's kind of an obvious area where there is more life, where there's like a pile of fish. And that's kind of always where I'll set up, be pointing in that direction. And that's what I did here. I got some boulders here. I'm pointing off at this pile of fish, which happened to be closer to shore. Sometimes it's out deep, sometimes it's closer to shore. And you can see this Moana Kali is just coming in, zipping back and forth, all kind of aggressive feeding. But they come along and I'm able to accidentally line up two, totally on accident there, but I got two of these Moana Kali's, which was pretty freaking sick. Second time I did that this year and I was pumped. So one of the things that I find really cool that I've kind of learned out here hunting in Hawaii is that the Moana Kali's tend to hang with the small trevallis. So they'll, they'll kind of be like maybe sometimes one Moana Kali and then a blue spot omilu, or sometimes even multiple Moana Kali's being followed by one or multiple omilus. And what's really, really cool about that is a lot of times the Moana Kali's are low in the water column. They're right on the bottom, but those omilus will be just a little bit higher up and they're kind of great indicators that you can see from further away. So if you see an omilu, 
a lot of times I immediately start looking because they aren't necessarily right on top of each other. The Omilu could be 15, 20 feet away from that Moana Kali school, still working together as a team. So that's what happened here. I could see that Moana Kali there and I could see the Omilu behind it and I was able to get an awesome shot on another one of these epic eating fish. So for these Moana Kalis, I like to really take my time and make sure that I get a headshot. I really, I'm, I don't want to rush it because so often if you just wait a little bit longer, it'll come back around and it'll keep presenting shot after shot after shot. But right here, I had my shot and my gun got stuck right there in the reef and that was the only shot I was going to get. Right here, I was coming, I was waiting for the turn, and then again, that little piece of coral got in my way, and you can see how calm I am. I don't wanna rush anything, because I think he'll come back, but this one didn't, and he got away. So this next shot here is a great example of kind of choosing your shooting lanes. And I didn't do a good job of it here, but it kind of worked out for me anyways. You can see if I'm positioned between these two rocks here. I have a very narrow window. I could shoot to the right here, or, but if I wanna shoot to the center, I've only gotta wait, I've gotta wait till that fish comes exactly in that V and stops, which is difficult. If I would have been a little bit more to my right and looking around the corner to my left, I would have had a much bigger shooting lane and probably a better chance at, at having a successful result. Fortunately, I was able to sit here, kind of wait, aim over the boulders between that kind of crack there, and you'll see what'll come up here, but this big, beautiful Moana Kali right there just came in. You can see how I have to wait until he presents a perfect shot. And luckily he did, and I was able to get another stone shot on a beautiful, great eating fish. Most of the time, hunting and landing these Moana Kalis is as simple as going to places where they will be, and then spending as much time on the bottom as still and as calm and as quiet as possible, and just kind of letting them bump into you. This one here, big, beautiful one, was just cruising along. I was scratching, he was able to come right over and I was able to stone a stud Moana Kali. So almost 100% out here in Hawaii, I'm doing the Espeto technique, which means I'm going to the bottom and I'm sitting and I'm waiting and I'm attracting those fish over to me. But occasionally, these Moana Kalis will be kind of feeding and really distracted and you're able sometimes to crawl over and get a approach and a good shot on them. What's important is the way that you crawl. That aguado technique needs to be so calm and so slow and so non-threatening to not ever disturb these animals. You wanna act like you would in the woods hunting a deer. You're moving, you're stopping. You're moving by crawling one hand across the bottom. You're not kicking at all. You're using those fins just to keep you up, using them almost as planers to keep you up off the bottom, and you're crawling over to your prey, then you're stopping, you're getting a little bit closer, until you close that gap and get close enough to get the shot that you're looking for. So almost 100% of the time that I fire my spear gun out here in Hawaii on the reef is from the bottom. But even I get tempted sometimes. You can see that collie there. It's a big, fat one. He's cruising along and he presents a shot before I hit the bottom and I take it. The problem is that was a low percentage shot at a fish that's moving away from you. This is the exact same fish. He stayed in the area and I was able to do another dive, hunt properly, get to the bottom and wait. And he came right over to me and I was able to take a much higher percentage shot at a fish approaching me. When you do this right, these Moana Kalis almost become like a science. You got them down. Get down to the bottom, really tighten up, be as low as you can, get something to hide behind, and then be still and wait. Those small scratching will kind of get them curious as if maybe a couple fish are feeding, but in reality, you're there waiting for the one to intersect you. They're sitting out there all day long, cruising, zigzagging all over the reef looking for food. If you're down there and you're hiding, more often than not, one will just bump into you, come over to check you out, and you can shoot at a fish that's approaching you that is unthreatening, and you can get beautiful stone shots like this. The water does not have to be deep. All you've gotta do is be out here on the bottom, really being quiet and waiting, and these big Moana Kalis will just inevitably bump into you and you get just great high percentage shots at the most delicious and beautiful fish out here in Hawaii. You do not have to be deep to find these and you do not have to stay long down here. This one here, I was 
only down there for 10 seconds. That's 10 seconds after I hit the bottom and remain relaxed, I got this stone shot. This next dive here is a real great example of a lot of those techniques together. I go down, I'm lying beside a boulder. I'm gonna, this is a moo dive. So I'm actually hunting this big school of moo here. And I want you guys to pay attention to my dusting technique, my scratching technique, because it's so calm. Look at this. I'm literally just patting and just kind of just tapping the, the rocks down here. And that's all you need. So many people tend to overdo this right here, making big clouds around them. What does a fish do when it's down there feeding? I mean, think about it. It's just pecking at these rocks, disturbing one, two at a time, just kind of moving them around, making a little bit of noise. It's not a big movement. Watch what happens here though, when I take my head up and I see the moo. They are as close as they'll ever be to you, usually right when you stick your head up. After that, once you start looking around just a little tiny bit, they're immediately gonna move off and be further away and your best shot at getting a shot off is right away. Watch how close the fish are and then watch, I bring my left hand down and then I start moving my head just a little bit and they're immediately moving away, they're done, they're over it. It's those tiny little movements that matter everything in this precise form of spearfishing. I honestly don't shoot that many uhu. I think that there's kind of other fish out in the ocean that I, I prefer to target more, but occasionally I get asked for one or two for friends and family and I decide to take one. Usually, while I'm doing that, it's just an incidental catch. I'm out here doing hunting the same way that I always would for the moo, for the ukus, for the big goats. I'm sitting here super relaxed on the bottom, doing a little bit of scratching and waiting to see kind of what approaches me. This uhu was just a little curious, cruising around, and I don't take that first available shot. I really wait until I get the shot I want and I'm able to get an awesome shot at these uhu because if you don't get a good shot on these things, you tear them off so often and it's the saddest thing ever to see them just explode and swim away. They call these uhus birds out here a lot and I think that's because they just seem to kind of fly around like birds. You can see how this thing's coming in and he's way too close and I really, really take my time to make sure that I get a headshot on these things because they're so soft and there's nothing worse than tearing them off. Another interesting thing I find about hunting these uhu is they seem to not tolerate any kind of movement. So if you're facing in the right direction and they're just kind of zipping around, a lot of times you can let them cross the path of your gun and you can get a shot. But if you try to turn the gun on them or try and turn your head on them, a lot of times they're just out of there like nowhere. So some of these shots just kind of happen by pure luck. I'm pointing in the right direction and they come too close and you get that headshot you're looking for. So again, this is that same technique that I'd be just hunting all the time. This is just the way I hunt. And when I'm out here, you bump into a lot of different species. So I'm on the deep side of the ledge, which is where I'm always at. I'm trying to find a little bit of sand there so I can be kind of comfortable. I'm looking to my left, to my right. I kind of want a good 360 view, but I know I'm probably not gonna shoot behind me because the ledge is there and that fish pile is up in front of me where my gun is kind of pointing and aiming and those uhus and goats are just kind of cruising around the bottom doing their own thing and you're just kind of waiting to bump into them and that's exactly what happened again here that uhu just came a little bit too close i was able to get the headshot i was looking for and land another beautiful fish so a lot of times what i'm hunting kind of has to do with where i'm at right here i'm in probably 90 100 feet there's very little reef structure. There's a lot of sand patches around, and I know I'm in prime Uku territory. I also know the sun was super low, and that's another great time to come out here and hunt these predatory fish. And you can see he kind of appears right there, and I'm able to be really calm. I got my bigger gun and wait until I can get the perfect shot, and I'm gonna land a delicious eating fish. Anytime the sun is setting out here and I'm way offshore, it is so nice to be able to stash my fish in the cooler and keep that blood away from sharks and I don't even have to think about it after I throw them in there. So this fish here has quickly become another one of my favorites to hunt out here, the knife jaw. And you can see he kind of ducks in, ducks out, comes in, comes out, and you really want to wait until you get the shot that you want, that you're really happy with, that you're sure you can stone them or get a headshot or land that fish. And that's exactly what happened here. I was able to stone this fish, which is the best case scenario, and land a fish that we're then gonna do the catch and cook on. It's a freaking phenomenal meal, and I can't wait to show you guys that next. 
So I have Ryan's knife gel right here. He's already filleted it. It's been in the fridge for a few days. We're gonna check it out. Oh yeah. This is a perfectly kept piece of fish. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a marinade out of miso. You're gonna wanna use white miso. We've made this recipe once before and it turned out awesome, but I think one of the keys to this recipe is that you really need to let it marinate overnight. We only marinated it for a couple of hours the first time and it didn't quite have the flavor that I wanted to. So we're gonna make the marinade right now. We're gonna put the fish in the marinade, we're gonna stick it in the fridge and we're gonna make this guy tomorrow. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our two liquids and we're gonna combine them in a saucepan and boil them. For the marinade, we're gonna use three tablespoons of mirin, three tablespoons of sake, half a cup of white miso and a third of a cup of sugar. 14%. Okay, right now we're just bringing this to a boil and it's gonna boil off all the alcohol really quick. And once that's done, we're gonna whisk in our white miso paste. Last thing in is the sugar and we're just gonna whisk it in until it's all dissolved. Once all of the sugar is dissolved, we're gonna pop it off the heat and we're gonna let it cool before we put it on our fish. So I have my marinade, it's been cooled off and now we're just going to layer it in this bowl with the fish. All right, we're gonna wrap it up. We're gonna put it in the fridge. And we'll see you tomorrow. All right, guys, we are back here again. We've got the fish. We left it for a little bit longer than we were planning on, but it's been marinating now for about 72 hours. It looks freaking incredible. I think my theory here is we left it for what? Five days beforehand? Yes. So five days filleted, wrapped in paper towels, sort of a dry aging, but maybe not really, depends who you ask. And now, then we threw it in the marinade and sat for 72 hours. And to me, I think it's like a completely different consistency than fish usually is, right? Yeah. It feels totally different. I hope it's good. Oh, guys, check this out, check this out. That right there is the hermit crab changing shells. When we got the hermit crab, we threw in another shell for him because we thought we had a bunch of shells that were kind of like maybe the same size. And guys, he's obsessed. This is the chart. Basically what we did there was we put a mark every time we saw him in the other shell. It's out of control. Like he goes from shell to shell to shell to shell all day long. Oh my God. Look at the caramelizing. Yay, three minutes each side or so. I think I'm gonna flip it because it's been three minutes and then after we've cooked it in the pan, we're also gonna put it in the oven for about 10 minutes or so. Oh my God! Oh my God! Woo! Woo! All right guys, I don't know how it tastes, but it looks freaking incredible. Okay, we're transferring it to bake in the oven. We don't have a cast iron skillet because otherwise we would do it like that. The oven has been preheated to 400 degrees. Shiitake mushrooms and bok choy, baby bok choy. Just gonna put it in a little bit of the sauce after the fish comes out of the pan and let it cook down in that. All right, I'm gonna check these puppies. Oh my God. Look at that. I feel like I'm at Nobu right now. Can, can I eat it? Wait, no. What? No. What, what if you eat it? We have to plate it. Well, can you eat no, it? No, let me plate it. Just wait. Don't touch it. Pick I want, one. I want a shoulder. I want pick that one. That's a good one. I want that one. No, you can have that one. I'll pick this one. No. Hey, all of you friends that we invited over to this knife jaw feast, you're missing out now. Okay, I'm putting a little bit of sauce on top because the fish was kind of dry. I cannot wait any longer, guys. Are you I'm sure trying. It's I, I don't care. I don't care. Oh my god. Are you sure it's cooked? It's cooked. It's so miso-y. Did we do too much miso? Are you sure it's cooked? It's cooked, it's like a, so what's going on here is basically it's almost like a cold smoked fish, you know? Where they're like translucent, but, but they're cooked. That's what we have. It's so flavorful that our problem is that it's almost too flavorful. Mm, that was a good bite. What are you talking that about? That was a really good bite. They're all good bites. Oh, is your bite better than mine? Maybe. I'm obsessed, guys. Like, this miso flavor is definitely a winner. You know, whether we did it for too long or too short, that's negotiable, who knows. But, I'm impressed. Is mine better? I think it was better than mine. 
back off. All right, guys, we're gonna eat this. We're gonna sign off of this video. Anything else? No. She's not impressed. I'm <laughs> over the moon with this recipe. Guys, thank you so, so much for watching. I know that wasn't our traditional vloggy type video, but I hope there was a lot of cool action shots in there. I hope you guys learned a lot from that spearfishing and this recipe. Definitely go ahead and try this at home. And thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Ryan Meyer's Expedition. I love it. Really? I love it. Like, I love it.